interesting applications. So take it away. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much for your, uh, yes, th thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's my honor to speak here. Um, okay, so today I'll talk about directed graphical models for extreme value statistics. So this is joint work with uh, Johannes Bach, uh, who's a PhD student, uh, and Claudia Kluberberg, who's, her, uh, who's his uh, uh, advisor at the Technical University of Munich. Okay. So first I have a question for you. Um, uh, so I, I'll give you two problems, okay? And I'll ask you which one you think is easier, okay? So problem one, um, you have a uh, river network, let's say in this case, the Danube, um, and I, I sample, you know, uh, I, I have 31 stations on the Danube um, and I record uh, the daily flow of, of the river, okay? Uh, but I'm not going to give you the daily recording. I'm going to give you only the maxima uh, of every week, okay? Um, so, so the data is, is, is a lot less compared to daily or hourly recording, okay? And your jobs, and I don't tell you how, I don't tell you any more information about the stations uh, or the river. Your, your goal is given this, uh, this uh, maxima recording, um, uh, can you recover the river network, okay? So that's problem one. Uh, problem two on the right here is you have a, a binary, uh, uh, a ReLU network, just two layers. Um, and so your job is to recover this, this, uh, this uh, ReLU network, right? So the weights here are, are binary. Uh, there, there are a sort of bias term, they're, they're real numbers. Um, the only twist here is that you don't get to see the input. Okay, so you only get to see noisy outputs. Okay, so, um, all right, so, so you get the outputs and then, you know, it's add on to noise. But if you can solve the problem, you know, the output problem without noise, it's already pretty good. Okay. So which problem do you think is easier? Recovering the network from a bunch of extreme flows or uh, recovering a binary ReLU network, but only from the outputs? I would guess the, the river network because I know ReLU net learning ReLU networks is hard. Okay. So... We have some experts here who said, yeah, ReLU seems pretty hard, so this one must be easier. Okay, um, great. So it turns out that they are essentially the same problems, right? So that's part of the point of this talk, is that if you can solve one problem, then you'll be able to solve the other, right? Uh, and in particular, this case turns out is a easy instance of the right-hand side, uh, which tells you that the right-hand side also has some easy instances that, that you can solve, right? And indeed, uh, it's just if I just give you this without the noise, right? Just seeing the output, I don't tell you what the inputs are. Uh, I don't, and and if I ask you how many input nodes are there, uh, that's already uh, kind of amply complete to to recover the number of input nodes correctly. Um, so this is a result uh, in 2014 by Shital. Okay. All right. So why why these problems? Well, they're not toy problems. They're very important. Um, so this hidden river problem is the benchmark for causal inference in extreme value statistics. It picked up a lot of steam, especially with the Danube as the benchmark data set, um, starting with this paper uh, in sort of the analyst of probability in 2015, and then followed by a bunch of paper in, in statistics. Okay. Um, now it's really, it's the, fan the, like, the fancier version of this problem is what people in hydrology really want to solve, which is um, I have a waterway uh, say like this map, right? Um, and uh, I have uh, sensors at various locations uh, and I'm tracking not the water flow, but some contaminant. So think some chemicals, or it could be a chloride concentration or you know, uh, some kind of bacteria in the water. Okay, um, so if you, if you do continuous recording, then you get to see you know, graphs like this, right? So um, you know, uh, the, the sensor would record at regular times, and then you see this, this curves, and your goal is given these graphs, um, recover, uh, you know, where, it, if you see a contaminant uh, spike somewhere, say here, um, some, something happening at B, you want to, to trace back uh, where is the source of this contamination. Okay. Uh, th this is a- Sorry, no, I, didn't, I didn't totally follow that. Are you gonna define the problem more formally, or uh, would you mind just saying a few more words about what the formal problem is? Yes, I'll, I'll tell you what, what the formal problem is. This is just, uh, yes. So here's the, here's the formal oh, okay. problem, right? Thanks. Um, no problem. Uh, so, uh, right, so if, if you're uh, just want to use like a vanilla Bayesian network, uh, you can, right? So you can uh, formalize the problem like this. I have a graph G uh, on D nodes. 
um, and I will put an edge I to J means node I is directly upstream from node J. Okay, so I have some graph. Um, I, I don't get to see this graph, right? Um, uh, and what I get to measure are just, you know, measurements, XI, uh, contamination concentration at node I. Um, and now here is my modal choice, right? I could, if I decide that I have, I put in a linear model, then the model would say contaminant concentration at node I is a linear combination of uh, its, its, you know, ancestors, right? Uh, plus uh, ZI, which is, which you think of as a random input source at I, right? So contamination at I could be uh, what you get from your parents, plus potentially, you know, somebody's just dumped like a massive amount of contaminants here. So that's, or could be from a storm or, you know, extra sources you don't know. Uh, that's your input to, to the system ZI. Um, can, so I, can, I just think, can I just think of the ZI as IID Gaussian or no? Uh, right. So, so ZI, uh, no. So ZI, you want to think of them as IID, but from an extreme value distribution, like a, okay. like a gumbo. Okay. That's right. Okay. Uh, yes. So that's, is, that's, is, it, uh, is it easy to see that this is identifiable? Is it easy to see that? Uh, so, yes. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a fun, like, it depends. You have to put some function on B, uh, some, some, um, some functions, some uh, some assumptions on B for sure. Yes. Yeah. This this I wanted to say I, I'm about to say this is not quite the right model, but this would be like the the basic model that if you didn't do any extreme value theory, then this is the first one you would start with. Okay. So I just want to start with something familiar. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Great. All right. Um, yes. So if you do a linear model, then this is how it looks like, and you can rearrange this equation. Uh, you know, you, you write in matrix form, right? Uh, you throw the B on the other side, take the inverse, assuming the inverse exists, right? And then you get X as purely as a linear combination of the sources um, at, the, at the ancestors, okay? So your goal is given these uh, measurement X and I's, uh, you want to, to recover G uh, from, from noisy samples, okay? So this is very classical, um, you know, linear, like if, if you believe the ZI's are Gaussian, then you just get a plain, you know, uh, vanilla, Gaussian Bayesians, um, you can, uh, you know, we restrict to the case where it's okay to, for, for nice river, you, you, it's okay to say the river is a directed acyclic graph, or even better, uh, the river is a tree, right? So for example, the case of the Danube, then, then it is indeed a tree, okay? Uh, so, so then for these cases, there are many techniques to recover it. Um, uh, yeah, so sorry, I was in a mad rush to prepare this slide, so I didn't uh, list all the names, but including, you know, there are many people in the audience who have worked on uh, techniques for learning uh, 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 Bayesian networks from data, right? So there's score based, right, constraint based, hybrid methods. Uh, if you're a tree, then it's, it's fairly easy. You just you just score each edge, and then you you find the best. Um, uh, the sort of the maximum directed tree that maximizes the total score with the uh, with the uh, sort of Chu Liu Edmund algorithm, right? So, all right. So if we just for a moment you know forget anything about extreme values, you know, just apply a vanilla uh, model uh, with averages. Um, does it work, right? Um, so you know, so given this extreme, the title probably you would guess not, right? Uh, so I just remind you the linear model is like this. Now the problem with this data. Uh, the, the actual, you know, uh, uh, river uh, contaminant data is that contam contaminants can only be detected above a certain threshold, right? So, so actually you don't really, what you're observing is not averages, but it's just the upper quantile uh, of a certain distribution, right? So you, 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 you need a model that can deal with maxima uh, instead of averages, right? The other issue is that, um, it, this seems to be like a fault of the sensors, right? If you fix the sensor, you can record at all instances, but that's not true uh, because by design, some contaminants are only released through uh, storm events, right? So there's a lot of um, bad chemicals in uh, our daily lives, like from the roof, from the car, on the road and whatnot. And when there's a big storm, um, then, then all of these get washed, uh, 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 washed off the road and it enters the waterway, right? So that's the only time that you get to see those contaminants and they usually come in massive quantity. 
So you have a very sensitive sensor sitting there, then most of the time it's going to detect zero. And then with a storm, it will detect a massive amount, right? So that's just by design. Um, you're not measuring averages with maxima. And also because if you're waiting for these storm events, uh, you know, naturally also if you're looking at maxima, you have few and noisy data, right? So this is a recurrent theme in extreme value statistics. You have few data, you're dealing with maxima and, and it's fairly noisy. So, so really the, the question you want to know is if I have a big value uh, at a node, uh, if, if I is honestly an upstream node from J, right? If there's a big value uh, XI, uh, then you would expect to see a big value in XJ, right? So you want to look at sort of tail dependence of random variables. Uh, and then that's, that's the theme of causal inference of extremes, okay? Um, yes, so I guess the, the most important thing is, you know, I'm dealing with Maxima, I have few and have noisy data. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Great. All right. Um, so now let me go back to the problem of uh, ReLU with binary weights, right? So here's a proposition. Um, it's stated a little bit sloppily because um, to quantify this part, uh, you know, uh, it, it's not difficult, but it, it just takes a lot more unraveling. Um, so roughly speaking, if you face a problem like this with extreme measurements on a river network, um, what you can do is you can take the logarithm uh, coordinate wise, um, and then uh, classical results from extreme value theory would tell you uh, this log uh, of X is well approximated by a ReLU with binary weights. Uh, okay, and this, these sources are unknown. So that is x tilde i, right? It's going to max over j of c i j plus uh, an, an, an input uh, uh, z tilde j, which you, which you don't get to observe, right? So this is the only thing you get to observe. The number of p's, this is the number of inputs is also unknown. And also uh, the, obviously the values of the inputs are unknown, right? Okay. Um, okay, so the proof is, is not difficult. Um, so it comes from basically two key results in extreme value theory, right? Um, number one said that, um, uh, well, you know, before taking log, then this is just a, you know, XI is, a, it's, it's called max linear factor model. So XI is the max over J of VIJ times ZJ, okay? Um, and now uh, sort of a classical result in, in uh, extreme value said that if you have, if you look at uh, maxima of IID, Right. Um, then uh, uh, that then you uh, then normalize maxima of ID converges in distribution um, if and only if the limit is a max stable distribution. Okay. So you think about this as like um, like saying that max stable distributions are the Gaussian analog for extremes. Right. So for you know for classical statistics, you know if you have sum of IIDs, you take averages. Right. Then then you know under nice variance conditions, you converge to the Gaussian. Right. So here, um, um, if you take normalized maxima IID, then it has to converge to something called a max stable. Right. And now the second result um, is uh, you know emerged later after people know more about different representations of max stables. Right. So this is. Uh, you can find it, for example, in a paper by Stoeff and, and Taku in 2005. They just said that max stable distribution, any multivariate max stable distribution, uh, can be approximated arbitrarily well by max linear models. Right. So the how well this approximation is is uh, is well, you know, the higher p is, then you know, the better you can, the more coefficients you have to choose, and so the finer uh, the approximation will be. Right. But uh, so so this max factor linear model is really a discrete a discrete approximation of a max stable distribution, right? So together, right, this said that if you have data where you believe that your data are just um, kind of maxima of independent instances, right? Uh, then you can approximate it with a, let's take the log, then you can approximate it with a ReLU uh, with binary weights, okay? All right, okay, so, uh, so that's nice. Uh, that, that, does, that, that just tells you the problem's hard, right? Uh, so your goal is to find the CIJ, uh, but you only get to observe uh, the, 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 the outputs. Okay. Um, right, so I, I just mentioned that this problem specifically in this form, 
not in the ReLU form, but in this form, it has been studied in the tropical literature. So this is called the tropical non-negative matrix factorization. It also has a name, uh, people also call it tropical PCA, uh, and, and people prove that it's, it's difficult, right? There, there are algorithms that, you know, designed to work in the general case, uh, but the, with noise, they don't perform, you know, amazing, right? Okay, uh, so now, uh, right, so, uh, so now a max linear model will have P inputs and D outputs. So is there an instance where we can solve this problem, right? So the general problem is hard, um, but if you happen to know that P is equal to D, uh, then this problem is, is easy, right? Well, it's, it, it's solvable, it's very solvable. So this is uh, the, sort of the main theme. Um, so this is again, another classical result from tropical linear algebra. Uh, it's just a manipulation of this, of this equation, right? So if I have P is equals to D, right? Then, then my matrix C is a, is a, you know, is a D by D matrix, right? Um, and suppose that D is support, supported on a directed acyclic graph, right? So the entries of, of C and R, except when I don't have an edge, then I have an entry of negative infinity. Okay, um, so uh, so if that's the case, uh, then I can rewrite this equation not x as a function of z, uh, but x as a function of x. Right? I can rewrite as as like a recurrent uh, 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 kind of a, 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 a recurrent network. Right? Um, so the point of this rewriting, right, is that first of all, this is honestly a a Bayesian network, right? Uh, in the sense that you know the random variable x, you know, is a its distribution xi is a function of its parents, right? Uh, but also, uh, you know, this is probably the best you can do, right? When it comes to binary ReLU, which is if you only get to observe the outputs, right? Then what you want to look for is some kind of, uh, uh, you know, is you want to exploit the fact uh, that there, there's, there's this, this, uh, the output of a ReLU uh, is piecewise linear. So you basically want to detect where it is, where, where the boundaries are. Right, and it, and and for that you have to figure out um, for each you know uh, tilde x i right uh, what are some linear relations uh, it must satisfy uh, relative to to, to other uh, tilde x j. Okay, so that's like the the best thing that you you could do. Right, so um, okay, so if p goes to d, then we have uh, this kind of uh, rewriting. Right, um, and so now uh, all it takes is to figure out uh, does it make sense to assume uh, in the river problem that I have P equals to D, right? Uh, so, uh, so this basically means, uh, well, that means the number of input is the same as the number of outputs, right? Uh, which means that sort of for each source, for each node I, uh, I have kind of a, a, a source uh, ZI, right? Um, and, and these sources are, are independent, right? So, um, so if you translate to hydrology term, it basically means that your stations are far apart so that when there is a an, a, a, an external source uh, that get detected at node uh, I, right? So if there is a some somebody dump a massive amount of chemicals at station I, uh, then you don't expect that to you know. Then then the only way that you expect to see those chemicals is because from I uh, uh, that chemical fall, uh, flow downstream and then get detected on node J, right? You don't get some other I prime that get the same dump. Of, of chemicals. Okay. So this is okay if your stations are far apart. If your stations are really close together, then one storm event could could create some uh, some you know could, could mess this uh, assumption up. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, so so all of that tells us that here is our problem, right? My goal is um, I have a DAC G. Uh, on it, I have a, uh, a, a matrix C, right, supported on, on G. I, I'm given a few and noisy observations from this model, right? Uh, and my goal is to learn the DAC. Okay. Okay. So again, here, uh, this is a kind of Bayesian network. It's nonlinear. Uh, I have few and noisy observations. Uh, but you know, I can still apply you know one of the two strategies for learning Bayesian networks. Right, one is to to figure out in conditional independence constraints. 
right? So uh, I compute from data and you know, from this model, what are all the possible conditional independence constraints? And then I find uh, a best DAC G, right? Uh, the, the problem with this is that max linear Bayesian networks, uh, they have a different condition, conditional independence theory from the classical one, right? So classical independent conditional independence is characterized by D separation. Um, so, so D separation is characterized classical conditional independence on you know on just usual Bayesian networks, right? Uh, but because here I have such a special form, uh, special subfamily of Bayesian networks uh, that it turns out I have a different conditional independence theory, right? And so we, we made a stab on this, but we haven't really uh, figure out, for example, how to compute such constraints from data. So it's 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 still very much uh, there's a lot of open questions uh, to 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 generalize constraint based methods to to max linear Bayesian networks. Um, now the other alternative um, is to look at score based. So I, I want to find a graph that optimizes some score, right? Um, well, uh, the most common score is a likelihood, but you know if you have few noisy data. Um, and if the data come from extreme, right? So this max is a very bad uh, operator. Uh, uh, you know, likelihood of maxima is 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 very uh, is very is intractable. Uh, you you can't optimize it beyond dimension three, right? Uh, so so that's not so great, right? So you just need a different kind of score, okay? Um, all right, uh, and also anything you propose have to be computable, okay? Right. Um, so. Uh, so what we did, so I should say we have proposed one score um, and it's very much still open as to what's a better score, right? So there's some suspect, suspicion that mutual information or, or some version of, you know, um, sort of conditional entropy would work well. Uh, I, I would love to see uh, sort of more, more research in that direction. Okay. Um, so what we did was we separate the issue into two parts, right? I have noisy and I have few data. So first, uh, what if I had uh, noise free but few data? Uh, is learning possible? Right? So it turns out in this case it's not difficult, right? So uh, if I'm noise free, uh, then I just rewrite this equation, right? So if I have x i minus x j uh, is is well, you know x i x till i is the max of this, so it's bigger than you know c star i j plus x j, right? So if I rearrange, then I have x i minus x j is bigger than or equal to to c star i j, right? So so once again, that tells me that this coefficient here is just a, a, a lower bound for xi minus xj, right? So and, and in fact, whenever an edge, you know, uh, j really, you know, if a flat at j really causes a flat at i, then I actually have an equality uh, that is, you know, uh, x tilt at j is equal to c star ij, uh, uh, sorry, x tilt at i is equal to c star ij plus xj, right? So that means that this equality for noise-free data, I expect this equality to be attained, right? At some samples points, right? If I have enough samples, right? So that tells me that this distribution of pairs, if I just look at uh, pairs of, uh, of, of nodes, right? If I honestly have an edge from j to i, then I expect that this, the distribution of this random variable has an atom at its minimum, right? So here you see like a simulation uh, of, of this uh, uh, phenomenon, right? So uh, here in this graph, I have three uh, points to two points to one, right? So in particular, you know, I, I also, three is also, uh, 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 one is also uh, uh, reachable uh, from three, okay? Uh, so the red uh, uh, points are the simulated data from the noise-free model, right? And, and the green points are, uh, uh, kind of, you know, uh, uh, this model with, with Gaussian noise, right? Uh, so it's, it's yes, yeah, so it's, it's important to, to notice that uh, I have two, uh, so my model is uh, max j, before I rewrite it like this, then it's cij plus zj, right? So these are the sources, which I don't think of them as noise, I think of them as input to my, you know, ReLU, and then on top of this, I have uh, noise epsilon i. These are like noise due to measurement noise, right? So, so the measurement noise is Gaussian, but the sources may not be Gaussians. Okay. Okay. So, if this distribution has an atom at the minimum, then I can basically, uh, well, I can detect it by a simple histogram, right? Um, if if I have perfect data. If I don't have perfect data, then how likely is there an edge from j to i? It's really a question of how concentrated my distribution is near the minimum. 
right? So, so it's not the value of the minimum that matters, it's the question of do I see concentration there to believe that there, there could be an atom uh, at this distribution, right? Um, so there, there are many measures of concentration, uh, but if you balance out, you know, whether it's computable, uh, so for example, variance of the case of the minimum order statistic works great uh, on paper, but if you want to compute such a thing, uh, it's, it's, you need a huge amount of data. Um, so if, if you want something that's, that's fairly crude, uh, but can, can be computed from data, then you can settle, for example, for the quantile gap, right? So the quantile gap is basically the gap between two quantiles. Um, you can take, for example, the, the gap between the, the let's say, the, the fifth quantile and uh, uh, some, something like the, uh, let's say, the, the 20th. So, so that would be uh, the absolute value of that would give you an idea of how concentrated your your observations are near the minimum. Okay. I have a quick question. Um, yes, is it please. clear that you can always attribute this to one specific edge? I mean, what if you have multiple things that have the same value? If you have the multiple things, uh, do, do you mean like if you have a situation like this? Right, where yeah, or, or a whole separate uh, uh, line of inputs going to three from elsewhere, and then and is it clear you could, you would be able to attribute those to two or maybe to four instead? Oh, right. Um, so yes, good, great question. So that's it, it's not true when you, when you take uh, averages, right? But it's uh, it's generally okay because I have a, a maximum. So the max operator is it's. So it's like a winner take all situation, right? So the if if I um, so the model set, right, that x i is the max in this case, like x three basically is the max of um, uh, you know c uh, uh, three two plus x two, c three four plus x four, uh, c three five plus x five, and c three one plus x one, right? So that's X3 is the max of this three, right? So then, you know, if- but The multiple of those can be the same, right? Yes, but right. So multiple of those could be the same only if your uh, distribution, uh, the, 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 the source distribution Z um, has atoms, right? Be because, so this was a rewriting from this model here, right? This is the original model, right? Um, Right, where where each node i has as a has a z i that that's the that's the thing that's driving all this. Uh, once you have the input z i, then the x what you observe is just the max of the z i's. Right. So now, if if the distribution of z i is continuous, um, then you don't expect this max to to be achieved at multiple points. Yes. Right. Okay. Sure. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah, but it, in, I mean, if it's discrete, then definitely things go crazy. Um, right. Uh, but I should say, like, for example, in this graph already, um, if this max is, is achieved at three, uh, at, 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 at one, right? So that means, you know, if, if one, uh, the flood at one was what caused the flood at three, um, then if I have a tree, then anything along this path would also achieve this maximum as well, right? Uh, because if I want to flood from one to propagate down to three, then it has to go to two, right? Um, and, and, and that's okay, right? Because, um, um, so, so when you're computing this concentration, uh, it, when you uh, compute this score, then what matter is that uh, you would have a higher score for, for the edge one to three, but what you want is that the score for the edge one to three, in general, you want it to be uh, uh, smaller than the score from the edge from two to three, right? Um, so this is saying that, uh, you know, it, it's okay that sometimes flood from one can cause flood at three, but you know, generally speaking, you expect that floods at two, uh, uh, you know, uh, fl flooding at two uh, causes flooding at three uh, more often than you know, uh, flood from one causing causing flooding at three. Right? And this is trivially true if you have no noise, right? Because uh, yeah, because what I just said that flood from one must travel to two before it goes to three. Uh, but if you have noise, then you know you want that this has to be true in expectation. Right. Okay, and that that's sort of part of our proof of consistency that this indeed check out if you have uh, sort of a continuous distribution uh, for the sources. Yeah, great, great question. Thank you. Okay, um, right. So then our algorithm is just for each score for each edge. I'm just going to score it independently, right? I just by 
you know, computing the quantile gap between xi and uh, it, the quantile gap of xi minus xj. Um, and then afterwards I apply, you know, I, if I assume it's a tree, then I just apply a uh, uh, Edmonds algorithm to find the uh, maximum uh, uh, directed sort of spanning tree. Okay. Uh, so because all of the computation just come from, you know, computing for each pair, it is a local computation. So it's, it's very efficient, right? So you can, um, uh, you can, uh, we, we have a theorem that quantify like what does efficiency means and it's a, is a, is an if and only if kind of theorem um, that said if, if you have, you know, not enough observations, then uh, you have unidentifiability issues. And if you have enough observations to make the model identifiable, uh, then, you know, with high probability, our, our, our estimator will be correct, assuming that there's no noise, right? Okay. Um, so, right. So that's the issue with few data. So now um, uh, you need to deal with the noise. Um, and if you don't, it, it won't work very well. Uh, so I, I have some graphs later on that shows that. Um, now, where does the noise really come from? Uh, right. So, so the noise comes from the fact that my model, ma the max linear model is an approximation to the maxima of IID. So, so in proving this, there was a proposition that I said, oh, I can use this model. And there was two parts, right? Number one was that, you know, normalize IID uh, conversion distribution to max stable. And then number two is that I can approximate max stable uh, with uh, max linear. Okay, so it's the first part that's, that's quite a, that that's not the, that approximation, you know, it's like saying you approximate the, 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 the sample mean with, with Gaussians. Well, you know, you need certain properties for that, for that to work well. Right. Um, so if you look at how data is processed, so this is by, for example, uh, this is really a uh, uh, standard. So this is from uh, uh, the paper by Asadi in 2015, right? So they were processing the data from the Danube, right? Um, so uh, what they did was they set a threshold about 0.9, right? So any, um, for, for each node, right? You only look at observations that are, you know, uh, in the 90th quantile and above, right? Um, but now uh, if you detect an extreme observation here at this time window, then they took like a seven day window around it. Um, and then uh, they look at all the other nodes and then they just take the maxima uh, over that seven day window uh, uh, of, uh, at the other nodes, right? So now this maxima may or may not clear the clear the ninety percent threshold for that node itself. Okay. Um, so here in this example, if I have this, this was node one, three, and four, right? So node one, right, was what triggered the seven day window. Um, so I detected a flood on node one. I look at over a period of seven days, and I looked and I found that oh, node three also cleared the threshold. Node four also cleared the threshold, but node two didn't. Right, note two uh, didn't ex experience, you know, a flood, um, but I have to record, you know, some values, right? So what I end up is I record the big, uh, the, the largest value for note two over the seven-day period, right? Uh, so what this means is, uh, and and this is very intuitive, right? This is saying if I have a flood, you know, if I have a flood here, then this flood is going to propagate downstream. So I see flooding at two, I see flooding at one, but you know, measurements at other nodes uh, is basically they're just they're not flooding right but so they're just maxima uh, but 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 they're not big enough to really sit in this max stable regime right so they're, they're big measurements but they're not big enough uh, for the approximation with max stable to work well right um, whereas my model right uh, my model then just wrongly insists that the, the data is extreme at all coordinates right so that's that's a very serious problem um there isn't really a good, uh, well, okay, I should say, I, I don't know of a good solution. Uh, so the, the trick uh, from extreme value is, uh, well, then, you know, if you, when you're doing this local computation to score an edge from J to I, if I only need to look at the quantile of the distribution X I minus X J, uh, I don't have to use all of my data. I can only, uh, I, I, it is enough to just look at uh, cases where uh, xj is really big, right? So I basically take for each, whenever I consider a, 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 a edge, right, a potential edge, let's say three to 14, right? Uh, then I look at uh, the subset of the data where uh, 
uh, where x3 was honestly big, right? That there was honestly a flood at node three. Uh, and, and then I can try to see if, if that create a concentration downstairs. But this is a, I find this, at least for statistic, it works okay. But for, um, from a modeling viewpoint, uh, this is very uh, kind of annoying. It would be nicer if we have a model that account for this fact, uh, but currently we don't, right? And so it's a sort of an open problem to, to really deal with this uh, in, at, at the level of the model and not kind of half uh halfway through uh, with the estimator, right? Um, okay, but the upshot is that we get pretty good results, right? So. Um, on left here is this no tears um, learning algorithm. Uh, so this is a, a, a very recent paper uh, by Zhang, Aragam, Ravi Kuma, and Singh. Um, so they give an algorithm to, to sort of learn a uh, 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 directed acyclic graph. Uh, they can fit linear and nonlinear models uh, and, and they turn it into a continuous optimization problem. Like I, I like this paper a lot. Uh, and uh, I mean, for the Danube, it works pretty well. Right, so on this is the result of, of this is their result. Uh, this is our result. Um, blue is correct edges, right? Um, red is sort of wrong direction, uh, and green is uh, correct direction, but it's not it is is not a correct edge, right? In the sense that um, I have a, a a green edge is or green or yellow uh, is an edge that goes from a grandparent to 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 a to to a child, right? As opposed to uh, going from uh, the parent directly to the child, right? So you see, uh, so, so reds are really bad, right? So there, there's a few wrong directions, uh, but not too many, right? So we also get a few wrong directions. We even had like a worse kind of error that that puts like the, the wrong root to the tree. Um, but yeah, so overall it's honestly, it's comparable, right? So that's the case with the Danube. And this is really surprising, right? Because I just been telling you that, you know, extreme values, everything has to be extreme. Uh, and now here I'm just fitting a, a, a linear uh, Bayesian networks uh, uh, that, that is, you know, the kind where XI is just the sum of CIJ uh, XJ, right? So this is just, I'm just taking averages. I'm treating the extreme data as if it was average and I still get decent results, right? Um, but this is a property of the of the Danube more than it's a property of the method, right? So here, uh, if I run the same thing on a different river, this is the, the lower Colorado, the one that runs through Austin. Um, so on the left uh, is their results, uh, which, uh, well, we didn't type it up uh, because it's not very good, right? So you see there, there's a lot of red edges, right? Um, on the right is Al's method and on the far right is the true river, right? So if you look at the true river, uh, all these black edges here, um, so we got like a few of these wrong skips, right? Uh, but very few, right? Overall, we, we managed to recover uh, the, the, the river uh, pretty well, right? Um, yeah, so any... So, so what's the what's the sort of in a nutshell property of the uh, uh, of the Colorado River that that's better? Yes, exactly. So that's that's what I I, I would tell you next, right? Um, so um, let me maybe I would skip this too, and I'll just jump straight to here. So what is the difference between the Danube and the and the Lower Colorado, and is there a theory that can explain it, right? Um, so we think that. Um, so we have an intuitive explanation. Uh, we conjecture something, right, uh, that I think can be made mathematically precise, but but I don't have a proof. Okay, so I, I would love to have uh, uh, an open quencher. Uh, uh, so sort of, sort of I, I would love to have an explanation. Okay, um, so uh, what happens if you just look at the data set, Colorado, right? If you just look at the data set, the Danube is very nice, right? At any station, at any time, you have a number that's not zero, right? That's not the case with the Colorado. Um, the Colorado is, um, is, you know, if you just zoom in to the part of the Colorado, it's like this, right? There, there's a lot of branches of the Colorado that suffer from drought, right? So you see here, there's a bunch of stations that just measure zero. There's a bunch that are missing, right? The sensors just fail and it takes like a couple of days for it to be recovered. Um, and then there's like massive uh, fluctuations, right? So, the, so what happened with the lower Colorado, you get the, the average regime and the extreme regimes differ widely, right? So in average, on average, you, you're in drought, right? So a lot of the stations, the average is zero, gives you zero information about, you know, what happens to the flood. And then you get a massive flash flood, which, which lasts for not too long. So some floods, 
the, the flaps have to be big enough before it can propagate downstairs uh, to, to, to other nodes, right? So it's not enough that you flood, you have to flood a massive amount before you can, you know, jump to the next node, right? So it's a very hostile kind of data set. You have drought, flash flood, fail sensors, missing data, you have dams that sort of cut the river into three parts. Uh, it, but it's very much like real, real contaminant data, right? So, so any method, I, I think method should be really benchmarked on the Colorado and not so much on the Danube, right? The Danube is really nice, right? And why? Well, if it's nice, then um, the link between an average uh, sort of Gaussian model and the extreme uh, is given by this result, right? So this is a classical uh, result from textbook. Uh, here's one possible reference, right? And what it said is that if I have a just a plain classical linear factor model, um, and if my my sources are heavy tail distributions, uh, and and my measurement noise is light tail, right? Um, um, then uh, then if you look at the tail dependence function, which is a measure of you know if x i is big, does it imply that you know x j is big? Right, that's what we want to measure. The tail dependence function of these two models are the same, right? Tail dependence function of a uh, sort of uh, a heavy tail uh, linear model and a mass linear model are the same, right? So what this means is that um, if the Danube is a is a river that can really be modeled uh, by this uh, linear model, right? Um, then, um, well, then sort of the average flow, you, you can recover the, the river from average flow, right? Uh, and and the, the, mo the, the noise that you're getting from the approximation is really because you are um, confusing average flow with extreme flow, right? So if, if average flow contains the same kind of information as, as extreme flow, then uh, it's okay. You can just fit a, a classical linear network and and you know you you would sort of expect to do okay right and that's so i have some graphs that sort of yeah so so we can i mean i think proving this is very important for extreme value theory because then that would tell you like where you should look for ex where when you should apply extreme values model and when like a a max lean, uh, sorry a, a classical bayesian network is enough right so um so uh, quantifying this, I think, is 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 really uh, uh, sort of important, right? Um, there's some plots that uh, probably I skipped. Th those plots are are to support my intuition of, of of this claim here, right? Of this this conjecture that basically, if your x follows in this regime, then you can and and you get e extreme values uh, from this model. You can actually still learn it with a linear Bayesian network, and 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 it will it it will do very well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Okay, so we have some results on consistency. Uh, basically, if you assume uh, IID noise, if the noise is is light tail, uh, and and this uh, Z, the sources are gumball, which is a, a classic uh, distribution in extreme value theory, uh, then you know our estimator with high probability uh, can can recover the true network. Okay, so uh, it's it, it actually so without the noise this. Theorem is trivial. With the noise, it took like 40 pages of calculations. It's, it's ridiculous. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, some some new techniques to deal with that would also be helpful. Uh, so there are applications beyond hydrology. So I, I would point it here. Here's a paper by uh, uh, Gipso and uh, and Kluberberg, um, and and they they use sort of max linear models to model uh, airline safety in Lufthansa. So this is the problem of uh, when, when a plane sort of touches down, uh, there's a possibility that due to a variety of issues, um, it, it might run run beyond the, the runway and, and stop outside of the runway. So that would be a very terrible disaster. And it turns out that, you know, it, you can model that, the possibility of that happened, you, you can model that with, with a maximum linear uh, model. And there, there's there been some application to, to real airplanes, right? Um, okay, so right. So, so in summary, um, I should say, uh, learning max linear Bayesian networks um, is really uh, the issues here. If you want to deal with data, is that it's noisy and few, right? If you just want to deal with theory, uh, then it's an instance of can I learn a two-layer ReLU networks uh, binary weights, but just from outputs, right? Um, so there, there are lots of we get one algorithm, but there, there are lots of things we don't know. Right, so there's better algorithms, definitely possible. And uh, for ReLU networks, I'm very interested in questions of going beyond two layers. Right, 
Um, and it's, I, th I think one possible answer is by the work of Ronick and Cording, who show that you know, Re ReLU network can be learned just by the uh, locus of, of, the, of the graph where it's not differentiable. And so I think that that would be a good place to look. Okay. All right, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent, thanks very much. Um, uh, I guess we're right at the time that, that the next talk is supposed to, to start. So um, if somebody has a quick question, I think it'd be great uh, to go ahead and ask. And otherwise, we're here. Feel free to share your screen and, and so forth. So I have a question. Um, in the hydrology application, yes. don't you already know the tree from looking at the river? Yeah, exactly. So that's that's why it's a baby version of, of the of the true problem I want to solve, right? The true problem is the contaminant issue, right? Um, and and for the contaminants, you don't know, right? You have no idea how these contaminants are transported because contaminants are not simply transported by the river. It could go into sewage, and sewage could leak, and th there could be many issues with it. Right? Yeah. But so so the reason why this hidden river problem is a benchmark is because for any method you propose, we, we have a gold answer. And so therefore we can just validate your answer against the goal. I see. Thanks. Okay, great. Yeah, sorry. I, I didn't realize that it's, I thought it was until uh, 45, but you know, wait, maybe I should have finished a little bit earlier. Sorry about that. Yeah. No, no, until 45 is perfect. Yeah, I think a couple minutes here and there uh, amongst friends, it's not a big deal. Um, Cool. Uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, if there's any other question, please definitely feel free to, to ask. Awesome. Well, thanks for a really interesting talk. This is a thank cool you. Awesome thank models. you. Um,